Rust is advertised as being blazing fast and memory efficient, but how do you debug what memory your program is actually using? The answer, you measure. The most important performance tip I can give you is don't guess. CPUs and compilers are so advanced these days that even code that looks inefficient can be compiled into very performant results. So when it comes to performance, measure, then make changes, then measure to see if your metrics improve. Today we'll be covering DAT or DHAT a powerful heap analysis tool. Now there are two terms that come up over and over when talking about memory, the stack and the heap. For today, you can think of the stack as all of the variables and arguments your function declares, and the heap as a database that your functions can access. By default, Rust tries to place everything on the stack, but there are rules for what can live where. The data placed on the stack must be a known size, like a U32, which is 32 bits while data on the heap can be as large as you want, which allows us to store arbitrarily large VEX. DAT will show you how much of that external heap database your program is using. Here we've got the result of running Cargo new to create a new Rust project. Then I've added DAT on top. This means we have DAT as a dependency in our cargo.toml. We've set debug equals one under our release profile, which means that we get the debug symbols. When using DAT, it's really important that we run in release mode because running in debug mode is just too slow to profile this. But typically release mode doesn't actually contain any debug information. This debug flag can be set to zero, one, or two, and in release mode by default, it's set to zero, which just gets rid of all the debug information. Finally, we've specified that our project has a feature called dat-heap. We could have named this whatever we want, I chose to name it dat heap because that will match what's in the docs when you go look at them later. Now this feature doesn't enable any other features, but if we look at our main.rs, we've got this config flag in two different places, checking to see if the dat heap feature is enabled. That means that these two items, line three and line seven, will only be compiled into our program if we've set the dat heap feature. When our program needs some memory, it can request that memory, which will then be what we call allocated. The piece of our program that allocates this memory is called the allocator. In this case, we can specify the global allocator to be the dat alloc allocator instead of whatever would normally be there. The dat allocator wraps all of our allocation calls and this is how it tells us what we've allocated and when. Once we've set up this global allocator, we need to create a new heap profiler using dat profiler new heap. This profiler will run until the completion of our program and then get dropped at the end of the main function. So all of this allows us to run this cargo nude binary with cargo run features dat heap, which will enable the dat heap feature and thus enable this profiler. If we run it, our program will compile, our program will run, and then dat will give us some output. Here we can see the total memory allocated over the entire execution of our program. In this case, it's 1,088 bytes in two blocks or two allocations. At some point in our program, the heap will reach its biggest size. So at some point we will have allocated the most data that we have allocated at any given time in our program. And this time of sort of the max allocations open at the same time is called gmax. So at time gmax, we also have 1,088 bytes in this case because we have a pretty simple program. At T end is the end of execution. So this is how many blocks or bytes are allocated at the end of our program's running. We also get a datheap.json file, which contains a whole bunch of extra information. We have a couple of options for displaying this JSON data in more depth in a way that's easier to read than just clicking into the JSON file. In this case, I've chosen to go to the website and select the datheap.json file. This opens up the JSON file into basically a tree structure that shows us when and where our heap was allocated at which points in our program. We've also got a number of different sorting mechanisms at top, but I won't use that for now. If we zoom out, we can see kind of a broad overview of what our program actually looks like. In this case, all we're doing is printing using the print line macro. So I would expect most of the allocations in here to be related to printing to standard out. So if we look at the root node, we can see the total 1,088 bytes in two blocks, and then we see two nodes inside of that block, one of which has 1,024 bytes, and one of which allocates 64 bytes. We also get some interesting information like the runtime of our program. So it took 172 microseconds to hit TGmax, 
and the end of execution was at 101 or 191 microseconds. So if we look at the first child node, we can see that there is 1024 bytes totally allocated. The maximum was 1024. At Gmax, we were 1024. And at the end of execution, we were 1024. Again, these numbers will change for more complicated programs. So I encourage you to use this on your own programs and see what it looks like. If we try to read this back, we can see that the YouTube data example main function on line nine, column five, is what's causing all of this allocation for the first block. And we can read that up through the sort of chain of allocations all the way back to the global allocator right at the top. So if we start at our program on line nine, the print line macro throws us into standard IO, standard IO, <laughs> print, then print two, then standard out, then once lock for get or init, then get or try init, then initialize. The once data structure calls the call one force function. We go through syscommon once generic call and so on and so forth. And you can read this all the way through to getting to buff writer with capacity and even down into vex. So a lot of these will be functions names like with capacity or with capacity in or initialize or something like that, right? Functions that are responsible for allocating new amounts of memory on the heap. So if we go up to vec here and we do a vec with capacity, for example, and we can go into the vec docs and look for the with capacity function, which takes a u size and returns us a vec. Now you'll start to see some things in these function signatures that you may not have thought of before. In this case, this global is the global allocator. And this function is responsible for constructing a new empty vec with at least the specified capacity. So if we specify five here, we will get a vec with a capacity of five. And we can read some interesting details about what kinds of data structures stored in this vec will cause different things to allocate. So if we have a vec of some type T where T is a zero sized type, then there will be no allocation at all and the capacity will always be a U size max. And there are more links here if you want to learn more about how a vec allocates new data and when it does that. For example, a vector of five elements might reallocate if you add a sixth element because it doesn't have enough space allocated to hold that sixth element, which is why we're storing it on the heap in the first place. And you can do this with all of these functions if you want to. So print line, if you look at the locking for print line, you'll find out that it needs to lock standard out every time we call print line. And that's represented in this allocation stack. Since this block is responsible for 1024 bytes, we can go look at the block that is responsible for the other 64 bytes as well. If we look through the sort of allocation stack history, we end up with box new, which is a structure, if you look up, that is specifically a pointer type for heap allocation. So when you box something, you're placing something onto the heap. Now this is all well and good, but what happens if we change some things? What happens if we say, remove some of the string in this print line? If we cargo run again, nothing's actually changed because that string is actually embedded in the binary and is not placed on the heap. It's exactly the same thing if we take that text and I write print line correctly because that's important. <laughs> it's the exactly same thing if we take text and we set it to be this static string slice and we print line text with this formatting string and we run this again, we get 1,088 bytes in two blocks. So we're basically doing the same thing. But if we call to string on that, then the type of text becomes capital S string, whereas before it was a string slice like this. So if we do to string here and then we pass that string to print line and we run our program again, we can see that we've got some extra usage here. So if I refresh and I bring the new datheap.json in, we can see there's three children in our program now. And our T gmax has gone up to 1,101, whereas our T end has stayed at 1,088. The first node in the tree is the same one we had before, right? It's the once lock, it's the vec allocation. The second one is our boxed mutex. And the third one is now interesting to us because while the other two are at main.rs line 10, which is this print line, so they're both coming out of this print line, the third one is main.rs line nine right here. And we can see that when we run to string, this function, make this a little bigger to easier to see. So when we run line nine to string on our string slice, 
we use core convert from string slice to turn it into a string, which in turn calls to owned, which in turn calls to vec because strings are backed by vex. If you didn't know that, it's easily provable by going to the string docs and clicking source, which shows you the string type with a vec of u8s inside of it. So a string is really just a vec of bytes, which makes it all the more reasonable that there would be a vec here that's allocating some capacity when we take our string slice and we turn it into an owned string. This of course is 13 bytes. And if we run with hello world, we get 1,101, right? But now if we make this string larger, then we don't get 1,101, we get 1,119. So we can see that the bigger our string slice gets, because we are allocating a new string here, we have to allocate that additional space on the heap when we create that string. Now, this is a very simple example. One of the things that I want to communicate here is that having a lower heap usage is not always the best option. It can be an optimization sometimes, especially if you're passing around a lot of data between a bunch of functions as owned data, which needs to be copied as you call each function on the stack. It can be an optimization to do your allocation ahead of time and pass references around, for example. So you might want to allocate on the heap once to hold that data and then not copy it every time you call a bunch of functions. So to show this in action on sort of a real world program, I've chosen a random day from Advent of Code. In this case, it's day 6, 2022. I'm going to cargo add dat, which adds dat to the cargo toml. I'm going to add the ability to enable this dat heap and include the debug information in our release profile. And then I'm going to do this in part one. So I will add our global allocator, the dat allocator that wraps our global allocator with the dat heap configuration. And I will start the profile inside of main. And now when we cargo run with the dat heap features with the part one bin in release mode, we can see that we've totally allocated 241,000 bytes in 3000 blocks. At the sort of most allocated that we are in our program, we are allocating 20,000 bytes in about four blocks. And at the end of our program, we have 1,088 bytes in two blocks, which should look pretty familiar. And it's familiar because if we look at what's happening at the end, we're print lining with our display formatter and some string. So this is the exact same amount of bytes that we're using to do the print line in our other program. And we can take the generated dat heap.json and throw it in. And we can see, say, there's a little bit more going on here. In this case, the program took 16,000 microseconds to hit Gmax and 16,376 microseconds to end. We've got the same numbers that we had before. So we've totally allocated 241,000 bytes and so on. And then down here at the end, there are four insignificant allocations. You'll see this if you do something like have one really massive allocation or a lot of really massive allocations, and then like a couple that are like, here's a byte or there's a byte. In this case, it's seven blocks that represents 0.23% of our program. So you can see truly insignificant in the grand scheme of our program that allocates hundreds of thousands of bytes. So in this case, we have the total for the first node at 158,000. And at TGMAX, it only ever allocates 104 bytes. Whereas the second node is the total of 50,000 bytes and at TGMAX only allocates 32 bytes. Now these numbers may seem pretty small, until you look at how many times we're allocating those 32 bytes. So in this case, it's 1,528 blocks or allocations in both of these locations. And if we look into the actual functions that are sort of being executed here, we've got line 12 inside of part1.rs, which is line 7 inside of lib.rs. So if we look at line seven, line seven is an iterator, which makes sense because that's what we're seeing here. So we've got this find right here and we're collecting inside of the find, which is interesting. So if we keep going up through our allocations, we eventually find iterator collect, which is responsible for allocating a new B tree set, which is backed by a B tree map. So you can see as we go through sort of the chain of allocations here that we actually can construct a mental map of where our allocations are happening and how much they're allocating at any given time. So in our case, it seems like any B tree set that we're collecting into here only ever really reaches 104 bytes. So if this is responsible for most of the allocations in our program, and we wanted to change that in some way, how could we do it? And actually something else we could do to show this off a little bit is right now we're doing slice.iter.collect and we're collecting into references to characters. We could change this to be slice.iter 
cloned, which clones each of the cars. And if we run this again, we actually see our total drop. So if we bring up the first option and the second option to compare them together, we end up with a total allocation in the first instance of 241,000 bytes and a total in the second of 143,000, which is significantly smaller. And we can see that we've cut down our allocations here. So from 104 to 506, that's exactly in half. And from 32, to 16, which is also exactly in half. I'm also realizing that I forgot to change the name of the day. So when you see day five here, don't worry, it is actually day six. <laughs> we, we are actually changing and running day six. I just forgot to change the, uh, the name of the package. It's also really interesting to note that the total number of blocks that we've allocated has stayed the same. So somehow we've reduced the amount of space we need by not using references when we collect into this B tree set. So there is an interesting way that we can figure this out. If we go to the Rust Playground, or really anywhere that you can run some Rust, and we do standard mem size of car and standard mem size of reference to car, we can run these and we can see that C is equal to four and D is equal to eight. And these numbers are in bytes. So a car by itself is four bytes, but a reference to a car is eight bytes. So that's how we trimmed it in half because before we were referencing cars and now we just have cars and you can do this for any type that you want. So for example, a U64 and a reference to a U64, in which case the size doesn't change. So a U64 is eight bytes and a reference to a U64 is eight bytes. So this shows how sometimes counterintuitively things like adding references everywhere aren't necessarily the best choice. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this look into DAT. I hope that you have enough information to use it in your own programs and even just start looking around and seeing what it looks like when you write a program, want to make a change, and then examine the result of that program. Have a great rest of your day and I will see you in the next video.